and thank you, Bob, and everybody at the ARF for inviting me. I'm always a, a little uh, flattered uh, to participate uh, in anything to do with the ARF and events like this one. They bring together uh, an extraordinary range of folks, like all of you seated at the table, many who come from very different uh, uh, industries from one another, but all of you who focus on and develop innovative techniques, breakthroughs, use of technology to measure and improve uh, the way uh, people communicate with consumers. It's also a bit of a selfish motive for me. <clears throat> See, the first time I was invited to an ARF uh, conference was just shortly before the 2008 presidential election. And you know, as smart as we political people think we are and as good as we are at strategy and data analysis, nothing trumps a little superstition for bringing the election home in November. So I am very happy to be back here. I want to try and leave some time for questions after this about the uh, election, if you want, or anything else about our politics. Although, <clears throat> you know, if you're like me, you might have had enough of it by now. But uh, we've got five months to go, and I'm not going to focus most of my remarks on this race itself, but I'll share some thoughts at the end about that, and I will try to talk fast, like the New Yorker I am, and take your questions about any topic at all. Um, but I do want to spend the next 15 or 20 minutes or so sharing some thoughts about the challenges we face <clears throat> in elections and think about them uh, and the approach that we take that might be applicable to the challenges uh, that you all face in your measurement and marketing worlds. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> Always good to take water before you start. Now, I, I want to say a few things at the outset that I believe are relevant. Uh, I come to this conversation today from a slightly different vantage point than most of you. I come much more from the persuasion side of our business, if you will, than purely the measurement side. And in politics, I don't want to make it sound like understanding past behaviors aren't important. In fact, some of past behaviors and associations are the most predictive factors in how people are actually going to vote, particularly party identification. But my ultimate mission in the work I do, <coughs> excuse me, is more about creating some game-changing strategies that help my clients win, give them some insights that are going to allow them to change their communications in a meaningful way, not just in the easy elections, but even when the odds seem very long, if not almost impossible. Now, I should also add, I know I've got some friends here, especially seated at the first table. Thank you. Nice to see Colleen. Great to see Dave back in action. And uh, we welcome you back to the polling fold. And I know that in a few months, Dave and his fellow folks from CBS will be giving me a hard time with the latest public polling data that they put out. Um, but my firm, which has been in business for about a dozen years, the majority of the work we do, even though we're best known for the work that we do in politics, is actually for our corporate clients. And we do a range of things for them, you know, from positioning. It's not all just competitive challenges. We do message development. We deal with crisis management. But I come to this from the perspective of also understanding some of the key differences from the world of politics and the world that you're all operating in. Uh, every day, and I do uh, enjoy the fact that I play in both arenas, and if truth be told, I look forward to the day when I never have to work on another election again, and I can only work for the corporate clients I have. Um, it's also undeniable and indisputable that the advances that have, uh, you know, come upon us in terms of new measurement techniques are putting more data in our laps than probably any of us in this room actually imagined 10 or 12 years ago. This is the reality in my world in politics as much as it is uh, in your world in brand campaigns. We have a whole room now dedicated in Chicago with people who just do data analytics, about 30 young kids who seem to never go home uh, or bathe. We do know that they eat from time to time, but they are there any time of night or any time during the day. Um, so we're all using these techniques. But my years of uh, working uh, on elections and on uh, political campaigns, and this is my third presidential campaign since 1996. So uh, when we win in November, I'll be the only person to have won three presidential elections for the Democrats. Um, I know it's a nonpartisan crowd. I'm just putting it out there. Uh, 
But what my experience tells me from all of this is that as, as productive and as, seduct and as seductive as a lot of these techniques are, and however vast the amount of data is that we have at our disposal right now, they can also pose some real risks and challenges for all of us, including people like me. The risk is really that we start to obscure some of the essential elements and the choices that voters in particular, but consumers also, face and the elements they bring to the table with them uh, for the decisions and the choices they're making. And I tell everybody that I talk to, clients, people at my, at my firm when we talk about data, that I believe that those underlying attitudes and values that people bring to the table are more important, certainly as important, but probably more important in most cases uh, than what you tell them to try to persuade them. Because if you have a fundamental disconnect with the approach that they bring to the discussion, with the conversation that they want to have, uh, you're going to miss them by a mile, and certainly uh, you're not going to get close to winning. Now, at the same time, I do appreciate the fact that elections, in many ways, are different from your endeavors. Uh, but the signature differences of what I do on the political side do create what I believe is an urgency and a competitive edge that can too easily uh, if we're not careful, become diluted, lost, or tempered in a way when we're analyzing data and making decisions going forward on the corporate side. Now, our primary distinction in the world of politics is an obvious one that we all know about. We only have one decision day. That's it. Your consumers are making decisions every day. They could be making the same decision in your category every day. Um, you know, they might decide once a week which gas station they go to, which supermarket they go to. For us, there's one, de one decision point on election day. And we either get that voter or we don't get them at all. That creates a certain pressure. Now, a second important distinction is that on election day, being second means you lost. <laughs> you can't be number two in the category and think you've had a good year. <laughs> It's a zero-sum game. Now, that creates an added little pressure for us, but, you know, it's like baseball. You know, if you succeed three out of ten times, you're going to get to the Hall of Fame. Politics, we try to do a lot better than that, but you're still going to lose your share of elections, and it never gets any easier. Now, I can't say whether this fact of a single decision day and a win-or-lose zero-sum game actually makes what we do any easier or harder than winning market share uh, in your more crowded categories and with your ever-changing categories, or whether uh, it's harder or, or easier than delivering a certain ROI for the ad campaign that you're focused on at that moment of time. But I do believe it forces us to dig deeper and more constantly, certainly, into the data that's in front of us and make sure that we're not missing something in the attitudes, values, and the dynamics of our contest on election day. The reality of that is a strict deadline like election day frequently means that our data becomes disposable, and it becomes disposable very quickly. Events can happen in the world that change the dynamic in the race. You can have a situation a year ago like the Arab Spring, which may occupy everybody's mind for a while. You can have a debt crisis like you have in Europe, or you can have a strong month or a weak month of job growth or several months that are going to alter the, the shape of the landscape that we're in in the moment. And we have to be flexible and agile and adaptable to ensure that our framework and how we've looked at this race based on where we started from and how we frame our issues still continue to resonate with the voters we need to persuade during these periods of shifting dynamics. Now, this doesn't mean that we constantly change our strategies and tactics. In fact, when we do this, as well as we really want to, it means that we, we have a pretty good strategy from the outset and we can maintain it and make minor tweaks along the, day, along the way. But we do have to keep very attuned to the conflicting feelings that voters are bringing to the table. And voters like consumers are not monolithic characters. They are multidimensional. Yeah, there are Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, and yes, that does seem to influence them but they are as susceptible to the dynamics in the conversation as they are to deciding that on one day they want to go to Smith & Walensky's for steak and another day they're going to go to McDonald's and they're the same consumer and they're the same person. They're just making a decision in a different context 
on each day, whether it's Tuesday or Thursday or whatever day. So we're framing our arguments in a way to try to remain as resonant as we can in the face of a lot of shifting dynamics. So I typically set out to try to examine the data that's in front of me, examine the data that we're gathering all the time, and I try to do five things as we set out on any strategic direction. Five things are very simple to me, anyway. I want to control the context of the debate. I want to set or raise the stakes that are on the line in each election. I want to define the choice as a contrast, always. A contrast usually in values and vision, more so than looking back just at records. I want to make my competition own their positions. So yes, we are in a competitive framework all the time. Some of you might be working in a category where you're a leader that doesn't have to worry about the number two for a period of time, or you're the number two who doesn't have to worry about the number three. Not as likely to happen today in the kind of rapidly changing media world as it used to, but we are definitely always trying to make the competition own its positions. And we need to have laser-like targeting, because we've got to get to 50% plus one to win most elections, presidential elections, obviously. The Electoral College makes a difference, and the map and all the intricacies. We have 43 different paths to get to 270 electoral votes in this election. It's one of the advantages we have, is we have a lot more paths there. But typically, you're trying to get to 50%. And if we do our work well, then we're going to be truly uncovering the hidden architecture of opinion that's informing that particular context. And we're going to develop a more persuasive, a more winning argument with voters. I sometimes talk about it, I think it sounds simple, but to me it's not. At a time when we have more information about individual voters than ever before, the vote lists that we deal with today are as vast as some of the consumer data files that we append to the voter list now. Every campaign, almost any large campaign with resources, is doing it. We have more information about their media consumption and we spend enormous resources during a campaign now to gather that information as well. So we're looking at both the behavioral data that's changing, we're looking at their media consumption habits, and then we're also using our current round of research to arrive at the key pillars I've just described, and that's the crux of what my work is. And it all, for me, comes back to two things, the challenge that we face when we have all this data in front of us and when we're out there polling, sometimes every week, sometimes every day in a week, uh, certainly every month, but it comes back to two things to get to that winning architecture. One is to know the limits of the data that we have in front of us, and two, making sure that we ask the right questions to learn what we need to learn. Now, in politics today, there's a great new obsession in the world of media. There's an obsession with historical data, probabilities, statistical analysis. You've got blogs on different sites that have their own professionals out there pushing all this stuff down. Uh, every day there's a theory about some other data point that's going to be the not only relevant but determinative of who's going to win the election or not. You can imagine it just makes my life a bowl of cherries every day. <laughs> uh, it is one of the most difficult things we have to deal with. Um, so, you know, you come up with things like no president since World War II has been elected when the unemployment rate was higher than 7.2%. That was Ronald Reagan in 1984, and of course that's true. But at the time Reagan was elected, no post-World War II president had ever been re-elected with an unemployment rate higher than 5.4%. And Reagan's unemployment rate was actually almost identical to the day he got elected in office. And by the way, why do we start post-World War II? Why are we leaving FDR out of it? He won three times with double-digit unemployment rates. Well, it was a depression. Well, we had a pretty big economic collapse in 2008 for the folks who want to start with the post-World War II data. There's another one I love that comes especially from my friends on the Republican side, and I say that in all candor. I have great friends. I do work for clients with Bill McInturf, who was John McCain's pollster, or, uh, or Neil Newhouse, who happens to be Romney's pollster right now. But this is a great one. No, one, no president has been reelected when the Michigan Consumer uh, uh, Sentiment Index was lower than 78%. They are absolutely right, that is absolutely true. But it's also true that no president in history was elected with a consumer confidence sentiment 
as low as the one Barack Obama had. In fact, he's the only president in history to have been elected when the consumer sentiment was at 55%. So yeah, I could pluck out that one piece of data and say that's a huge one, and that's the one that matters. But by the way, I, I should email Neil and tell him that the consumer sentiment is above 78% again. It was 79% in May. Um, last year, late in the year, Nate Silver, I don't know how many of you read 538.com, uh, the New York Times blogger. Nate's a great guy. He's made a whole career out of probability analysis and statistics. He's a young guy. He loves data, and it's incredibly entertaining stuff. To Nate's credit, at the end of every year, he puts out a blog post that says, here are my smartest and dumbest blog posts of the year. He owns up to it. So one of the ones that ranked as his dumbest one was in the fall last year. He said and wrote that the Iowa straw poll in Ames, Iowa, big event, candidates pay to go to get people to vote for them. Only the Republicans had it this year. Uh, the Ames, Iowa straw poll is the biggest predictor of who will win the Ames, uh, the Iowa caucuses once the poll has been conducted. Now keep in mind that 6,000 Iowans go to this straw poll, and it's like a state fair. But Nate wrote this, and he put it out there, and I don't know how many of you know this, but the winner of the Iowa straw poll in 2011 was Michelle Bachman. I assume you all know that she didn't make it to the nomination, right? And maybe you know she not only didn't win the Iowa caucuses, but she came in sixth and folded up the campaign the next day. I love Nate's stuff. He is extremely entertaining. And I believe all these tools that he uses and we use, we should use them. But we should be careful with them. We shouldn't allow them to overshadow the human dimensions of what's going on uh, on the side of decisions that people are making because human beings, as I've said, are fluid. And frankly, the decisions that they make are often irrational, or at least irrational is the, meaning the emotional side, right? The opposite of, emo of, of, of rational uh, being irrational, emotional being linked in the analysis of neuroscience to the irrational side. I know you had David Brooks last year. He's a great friend of mine. We, uh, uh, his, his book was fabulous. I hope he talked to you all about his book when he was here and not just politics. Um, but this element of emotional or irrational decision making is fascinating to us because not everything uh, is logical uh, on its face. Now there may ultimately be a logic to the data we examine. In fact, I believe there is. Um, but you know, I view my job as figuring out the illogical cracks and the illogical alleyways through the data so that we can tap into something emotional in voters and raise the stakes for them and make them vote for our side. And I, I, I talk about Einstein a lot. I love Einstein. I think it's great. We all know the quote he, he had about research, right? That if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research. So, but, but Einstein also said that logic can get us from point A to B. Imagination can get us everywhere. And when I look at a data set, that's what I'm thinking about. Where is this going to take us uh, that's going to be unpredictable? We write our questionnaires in that way. You know, the first lesson I ever got about polling was with a kind of grizzled old political operative in the state assembly, a guy from Brooklyn who unfortunately died in a car accident pre prematurely, a guy named Tony Genovese. He was a great guy. And I said to him, so Tony, I was a reporter at the time with the New York Daily News, asking questions in another milieu, but a good training ground for being a pollster, by the way. Actually, probably a better training ground than being you know, a statistical expert, because my job there was to get people to answer questions that they didn't normally want to talk about or that they didn't normally want to, want to answer. So I asked Tony what it took to create good polling. What was, it, what was the real secret? And he said it was pretty simple. And it's probably about as simple as I ever heard anybody say it. He said, you have to know what you want to learn, and you have to ask the right questions to make sure you learn it. And that's how I view my job. At my firm, the, the guides we write in qualitative work, the surveys we write, tend to be extraordinarily complex. They're multi-layered. We warn clients up front, it's probably going to be longer than what you're used to. It's very nuanced, because one of the things we want to do is cut through the conflicting sentiments that people can articulate in survey responses, and we draft questions to specifically try to cut through some of that. It's often painstaking and arduous. I love writing questionnaires. I don't get to do it often enough. We were sitting at lunch before, and I was doing some edits on this, and somebody, Bob and Colleen, friend of mine, said, oh, you're still doing some edits. And it reminds me, I, always, I was asked once about eight years ago 
by someone in my firm, an analyst, a young woman, and she said, do you ever stop writing a questionnaire? And I said, no, why should I? As long as I can think of a better way to ask a question, to better learn what it is I want to get from the data set, why would I stop writing it before I have to? At the same time, though, and I think this is more important and more germane today, for today, I tell everybody at my firm that when you're writing a questionnaire, every question has to have a purpose. There are no throwaway questions. If you're asking them, there's a reason for them. There's a hypothesis you want to test. There's some nugget of information that you want to get. And that's a very important thing because that's how you make sure that your questionnaires are going to give you a data set you can work with. But at the same time, when they get the data and we have the results, I also tell them that just because every question had a purpose doesn't mean that all data is created equal. It's not. You're testing out your hypotheses in your data. You're looking for nuances. You're looking for some avenue in. And it's not always going to come from every piece of data. Don't be afraid, I tell them, to take a data set that has 100 different questions, you know, 90 different banner points and subgroups that you've looked at, you know, and present the 10 most relevant pieces of data to the client that tells them the story that they need to, to know. So when we do this at our firm, uh, we do it on political campaigns. And I thought I would use a, a real world case to try to uh, illustrate the point. Um, one of the most difficult challenges I ever had was we were approached in 2010 by a group to help uh, uh, beat back a constitutional amendment in the state of Mississippi called personhood. Um, personhood is a pretty simple concept, and it's cropped up all over the country if you're not familiar with it. It's a one-sentence constitutional amendment that defines life as beginning and personhood, life and personhood, as beginning at the time of conception. Now, these amendments had enormous but not obvious consequences regarding abortion, birth control, things like in vitro uh, fertilization. And every data point that we had, attitudinally, demographically, was solidly against us. And the coalition we had hired was largely made up of pro-choice progressive activists who had been locked into 30 years to having this debate in a certain pattern, using certain words, and they were pretty wedded to them. But they also understood that if we defeated personhood in Mississippi, we could defeat it anywhere. And so we agreed to do the work, but we also asked that if we do the work, we have to be free to play with the language and maybe move away from some of the traditional arguments that had been used for the past 30 years since Roe v. Wade to try to be beat this. But just to give you some sense uh, what we were up against, Mississippi, very conservative state. You probably know that. 60% of people in Mississippi identify themselves as strongly conservative. 70% of people in Mississippi wanted to ban all abortions or make it legal only in extreme cases. The pervasive belief across every group we talked to in Mississippi was that life, in fact, did begin at conception. And so therefore, this amendment was really reflecting and restating their own values. 66% of every voter in Mississippi, including a majority of every demographic voting group and attitudinal group, even Democrats, there aren't a whole lot of Democrats, 66% initially supported the amendment, and strong supporters were three to one over strong opponents. 45% strongly supported, only 15% opposed it. There was also in our first poll not a majority of respondents that when we gave them the facts about what personhood would mean, that they believed them or thought they were credible. And most problematic of all, because this you know, did have an impact uh, on abortion, obviously, most problematic of all was that 78% of people in Mississippi, including 60% strongly agreed, believed that too many women and were using abortion casually as a means of birth control, 78%. These were staggering numbers. And when I go through the list, I think it's probably the most daunting set of data I ever had in any political fight. And I actually still find it hard to believe that we defeated this amendment one year later. But we did. We had a year to work on it. And we did a lot of qualitative. We did a lot of quantitative. And what we were doing in this particular case, and this is where I think you know, what, what my art form is, is really relevant, is we really did have to find cracks in this data. 
we were up against this kind of monolithic block of opposition. And we didn't even know how to get to first base to have the conversation with them. We had to find any sliver, any crack we could to push the door open, ajar, so that we could begin to have a, a contest here, a conversation and a contest. Uh, we knew there were also a small, not a small sliver of voters, but there was a target group of voters that comprised about 35%. Remember, we had people dead set voting for this amendment. We had a small group of voters that said they would vote for it. But we had 35% of voters who we loosely qualified as, as swing voters. They were swing because they tolerated abortion, as I said, in some of the most extreme cases. But our task was such that we had to win 70% of those voters to defeat this amendment. We had to win more than two out of three of them. And all we did in our research was talk to these voters, most of whom were women, but their husbands also, and the men in their lives also. Um, but all the conversation, all the language that we tested grew out of our qualitative work with them. We felt that if we were going to have any chance of defeating this thing, we had to use their language. We did online chats with them one-on-one. -on -one. We did focus groups with them. We did triads with them. We did, in some cases, panel back interviews, going back to them after the data. And then what we did is we kept taking and distilling their language, and we tested them. We brought some of our insights uh, to the table so that we could really understand the nuances of language, even down to testing the impact of a single word so that we could open the door and have this conversation that we wanted to. When we provided a street strategic roadmap uh, after about six months of research, we identified three challenges to honing the message. This wasn't our messaging, but there were three big challenges that we faced, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on them. But number one, they were reluctant, voters in Mississippi were reluctant to empathize with a woman considering, in the abor considering an abortion. And the consequence for our side in terms of how we talked about this was that we had to avoid the traditional empathetic language or language about privacy that the movement folks and the progressives had been using for years. We couldn't say things like, none of us can know what she's going through. Voters also in Mississippi did not believe that abortion was a right or a choice. And here this was the pro-choice movement, the right to choose movement. That meant we had to abandon three decades of language and find something else to describe this. And we landed on the phrase, an important and difficult decision. Now when you think about this for a minute, it, it was a significant shift from where the movement had been, but the validity of it was immense. Because for most consumers, a choice is casual. A decision is a weighty thing. And so by us recasting this, we're almost rebranding the discussion for all purposes in Mississippi. The last challenge I mentioned to you is that voters didn't uh, see the consequences of what this amendment would do. What we had to do is find our opponents' words, the supporters' words, to use it. And luckily, they, they accommodated us. Now, we kept these caveats in mind as we finished our research and created a messaging architecture that ultimately had three pillars to it to push back against this daunting data that we believe succeeded because it did reflect values, attitudes that people were bringing to the table. Our first major barrier was that people believed women were using abortion casually as birth control, as I said. So our strategic imperative here was to control the context. Make them think differently about this decision that every woman is making, and we describe this imperative as using every opportunity to change the face behind abortion. And our language made people focus on women whose lives were at risk. We found of the normal exceptions, rape, incest, their lives at risk, this was the most powerful one, and, and we hewed closely to that one for most of the time. We use the language that this is an important and difficult decision for anyone. And we used anyone instead of just the woman most of the time because we wanted to loop in the next thing, which was very important, which was that it was a decision to be made by a woman, her family, and her faith. So the use of the words anyone, and this is where we got down to the single words, the use of the word anyone in family, and family in particular, actually became an unbelievably powerful but implicit pushback against the notion that a woman seeking an abortion was doing this casually. A woman with a family is not using abortion for birth control. And we learned that we were able to incorporate that kind of language into our messaging. 
Our second barrier was the notion that this amendment just sounded immensely like common sense, sounded very reasonable to these conservative voters, and the consequences to them weren't obvious. So our, uh, our, our imperative here was to run against the amendment, not run for abortion rights, another concession from the movement folks who, you know, have been doing that for a long time. And here we had to raise the stakes and make the opponents own their position. The good news for us, as I said, they accommodated us, which we don't always get uh, in campaigns, but they stated exactly what we wanted people to believe. So anytime we communicated, we were able to say that supporters of this amendment acknowledge that this would ban the most common forms of birth control, including the pill, that it would ban in vitro fertilization, which helps families uh, have children, and that it would ban an abortion even when a woman's life was in danger. So our approach here was right, but they, as I said at the outset, we never look a little luck in the face. The third pillar was a little bit tricky because for our coalition, it wasn't a natural place to go. The other thing about strongly conservative voters in Mississippi is they're not big fans of government. And they're certainly not big fans of government intruding in people's lives. So even though we were coming at this from the progressive, the left-wing side of the political perspective here, we wanted to tap into this core value on the part of our swing audiences and take a page, frankly, from the pretty effective playbook of the right uh, wing of the Republican Party in this country uh, and use their own value against them. And so our, our message, part of our message, our third pillar became how government has no place in these important and difficult life decisions that are better left to a woman, her faith, and her family. Now, I can say honestly that these three pillars never swayed during this. And not only did we win this, but we won, we defeated it with almost 66% of the vote. November 2011 wasn't a big election year, but it was all over the news that night because it was a stunning upset. Now, they tell me I'm out of time, and I'm hoping to leave time for a couple of questions. If not, I'll hang around a little bit for folks, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't just sum up by telling you a couple of things about uh, the, the current competitive election that I'm working in and that consumes most of my time. We always knew that the 2012 election would be close. We knew it would probably be closer than 2008. The fact is that when Barack Obama was elected in 2008, he was only the fourth Democrat in history to get 53% of the vote or more. And we always expected it to be closer, but we also expect and still believe this, that we have about 150 days to go, that if we execute our plans, if we put in place the right messaging architecture, we're going to win again in November. But there is an enormous amount of data coming at all of us now, too, in addition to all the things those little analytics folks work at. I live in the world where, as I said, public polling comes out every day. I've got to deal with it. There is, on average, a new public poll a day. There are polls coming out from universities and colleges that we never heard of. Um, I'm, not, I'm not even sure where they are, some of them. Uh, I went through a six-week period. There were 45 polls during one six-week period, 42 days, 45 polls. We've had weeks where eight polls come out in a day. Some of them, in one week, we had eight polls come out. One had us up nine points. One had us up seven points. Four had us even. Uh, one had us down a point, and two had us down three or four points. An enormous range. Not impossible, maybe improbable, but not impossible that in the span of six days we would have that kind of variation among the electorate. Because the electorate is just not all that volatile. And from my vantage point, there are a few things that are important and that jibe with some of the things I've said. I believe the stakes in this election are extremely high. I do believe this is a make or break moment for uh, America's middle class, for those people working to get there. Uh, as far back as 2005, after the Democrats lost the 2004 election, I've been doing research with what I would call mainstream, middle income, middle American voters. And I don't mean middle American just geographically. And that work over the last seven years revealed an anxiety that was percolating in 2005, that they believed that the rules of our economy were shifting. They believed that the game, uh, as they believed they had to play it to succeed and get rewarded, were shifting. And they weren't like tectonic plates shifting slowly. They saw their economic world falling out of balance. They didn't know what to do with it. And the economic collapse of 2008, in September of that year, which was devastating, devastating, 
on every front all across the world, certainly in America, was a culmination point for them. It was the apex of what they'd been experience, experiencing. But they've actually understood that this crisis was uh, not created overnight and that we wouldn't get out of it overnight. And one of the things President Obama always says, and he always said it during the campaign in 2008 also, whenever he would see particular data, he'd always say, it's amazing that the American people are always out in front and ahead of their politicians on big issues. And so they knew that this wouldn't be solved overnight. They knew the recession and the collapse uh, that caused it was no ordinary recession. You know, during the transition, we asked people how long it would take for America to get its economy back on track. And they said the, the plurality, close to a majority, said five years. They asked that question three years later, and they're now saying two years. So the five-year frame in their mindset hasn't changed. The truth is, with collapses like this, it, it has taken some time. Now, over the next four months, I believe that they're going to view this election in this context to some extent. They're going to look at where we've been. They're going to examine how we got there. And they're certainly going to look at where we're going. Now, my view about elections, as you could probably tell, is that there are always choices, not simply a referendum. I don't care if an incumbent's been there four years, eight years, or 12 years. The first race I ever worked on was Mario Cuomo's attempt for a fourth term in 1994. But I don't believe they're ever a referendum. And I think with the stakes for our country as high as they are now, I believe that voters in 2002 are making a very forward-looking choice about where they want their lives to be and where they want our country to be not just four years from now, but a generation from now. I think they're making a forward-looking choice about whether the economic vision we need is one built around a theory that says we need to make investments now for our future in things like clean energy and education or whether we need to cut our way to prosperity. Uh, I, I believe that at the end, the American people want to create an economy that's built to last, that allows us to compete with the world. And I think that's the argument that we're going to have over the next four months. And after that choice is made in November, I promise to come back to ARF again, take questions for as long as you want, because I know we probably only have a few minutes today, and talk about whether or not when we look back at this election, you'll be able to say to me, I counted the right things that mattered or I counted the things that didn't matter. Thank you very much. Are there, Bob, you're in charge. We do have time for one or two questions. If somebody would like to ans ask a question, we have microphones on okay. the floor. I think we've got one coming on this side first. OK, we'll, we've got time for two. There it is. Mike Hess with Nielsen. This is about Europe. We all know that when Europe goes up, the stock market goes up. When Europe is in bad crisis for a few days, the stock market goes down. What do you think the impact will be of Europe and the way it's playing out on the election? Yeah. Um, look, first thing, let me take the stock market piece of that question first. Um, Voters do not look at the stock market. The American electorate does not look at the stock market as a measure of anything. They actually are quite suspicious of it now. They're very, uh, they understand that this is something where big investors are controlling what happens every day. Those that are in the market get the concept of nano trades and how the market can be regulated and manipulated in, in, in you know, nanoseconds. So the stock market is not a barometer to them of uh, economic security. They tend to look very closely in their own communities. They judge the economy, in fact, by things close to home. You know, are there fewer uh, uh, houses staying on the market longer? Are there, uh, you know, empty stores getting filled up? Basic things like that. Uh, that that's how they, they tend to judge it when you talk to them qualitatively. Um, you know, interesting, I said the Mich Michigan consumer sentiment went up in May at a time when our job numbers were softer. That doesn't there's not necessarily a correlation there. But the, the larger European problem is one of those external factors that could shift the dynamics. Um, you know, Spain looks to be getting onto stable footing, but it's going to be pretty turbulent over there. I think there are obviously countries that are very invested in maintaining that stability. But, you know, if more countries in Europe uh, fall into a recession, the reality is the harder it is for our economic engine to keep growing and churning at even a a, a moderate pace. So uh, it is one of those, you know, when I first worked for Mario Cuomo in 1994, 
Uh, I had been a reporter and I covered him and the first thing he told me the first day I was on the job, he said, he always called me Benenson. He said, let me tell you something. He said, no matter how well prepared you are in any election, there are going to be three things that happen that you couldn't have anticipated or planned for. And how you react to those is going to determine who wins the election. And generally, he's been right. You know, if you think back to 2008 and during the financial collapse, John McCain had a tough week that week um, while, you know, the world was kind of imploding around the banks. Um, I think that's one of the big variables out there that, that we, we don't know how it's going to impact us. But it's one of the things, obviously, that we'll be watching closely, both, you know, from a policy perspective, the folks in the White House, and politically from mine. Do we have a second one lined up? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hi. So my question is, while most of your research has focused on helping people make a choice, what types of research would you recommend or types of, maybe it's broader than research, things would need to happen to get people to just show up? Because I think that's the problem is we're so divided because we're talking to a smaller and smaller group of people who care about A or B and we're forgetting the others that aren't even participating in the conversation at all, and we, it looks more decisive than it actually is. So I'm wondering what kind of research, if a client came to you and said, how do we get more civic participation locally, nationally, what kind of research would you design to you know, answer that? You're talking about politically getting people engaged. Well, politically, and but showing up at the polls, poll showing up at the polls, showing up at the local school board meeting, showing up at just being civically engaged and caring about the policies that are being, you know, implemented. Yeah. How would you design that Look, research to find that answer? You know, there's a guy named Curtis Gans who runs a voting institute who has studied voting patterns all over the world. And, you know, at a time when, when turnout was a lot lower than it was now in terms of elections, that's a, that's a big question. You've got a lot of ground there, there to cover, so I'll try to do as much of it as I can. But let's just start with elections. Um, you know, one of the things Curtis was looking at is a, you know, low turnout in the United States in, in, in the early 1990s, and he's looked at them all over the world, and he said, you know, we have had a pretty orderly democracy for 200 years. And while we in the political world and those of us who are engaged hash this out, you know, you compare that to the rest of the world where sometimes the vote is about whether they're going to live or die, whether they're actually going to go to war or not, uh, you know, whether they're going to be free or not. Uh, you know, I think I, we, we all probably still remember vividly the lines of people voting for Nelson Mandela the first time you had open elections in South Africa. And, you know, we as Americans can take our, our democracy for granted a little bit. You know, we are the longest, most stable democracy in the history of the world. That being said, we all would like to see more participation, but voting in presidential elections has actually gone up the last few cycles. You know, if you go back to the one that came down in Florida with, uh, with, with, with uh, Al Gore and George Bush, about 100 million people voted. You know, uh, two elections later, 133 million people voted, and it's not just all population growth. Your issue at the local level is, is, is another challenge. Um, but in terms of the research we drive, I mean, look, in our campaign, obviously, turnout's a big deal for us. So we're using all kinds of research. We're, we look at, you know, online communications. What are the buttons we push that get people to respond? You know, our campaign has identified $3 as the donation that we need to hit this time to get people engaged in giving money. Last time it was $25. It's not that we want less money coming in through the online solicitation. We want more people because we're trying to get them more engaged. And $3 is the number at which we can maintain our equilibrium financially but get more people engaged in our campaign. Um, look, I think uh, if you really want to get philosophic about it, the heart of this is going to go back to our education. You know, we've got over 300 school districts in America today where kids go to school four days or less a week. We don't teach civics and history the way we did uh, 30 or 40 years ago. The appreciation of what our Constitution actually means and what our founding fathers were doing from a historical perspective is not something that most Americans know anymore. So uh, I, I think that, you know, it sounds a little hokey coming from somebody like me. But I think if we don't do the basics on civics, uh, then, you know, you're going to get the democracy that you invest in. How are we? We are great. Good. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.